Welcome to Bible 180 Lamentations. This is a personal look at an absolutely catastrophic event, the siege and destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE. This sort of policy was designed by superpowers to completely decimate a people, to break their spirit, and force them to start from ground zero. Tyrants would use this policy to make their subjects more malleable uh, because they'd have nothing to return to, including a hospitable land, family or friends back home. The Book of Lamentations circles this tragedy from a variety of angles, and it's a plea for rescue. It's a protest of the evil it has endured, and it's a processing of the sorrow, outrage, betrayal, and contrition. Chapter 1 describes God's people as the daughter of Zion weeping bitterly for her dead husband, Jerusalem, and for her exiled children, the Jews. She was once beautiful and proud, but now she is a wreck. She can now see that this is because of her rebellion and sin against the Lord. Chapters 2 and 3 describe the wrath of God, which is not spontaneous or out of control, but which has built an intensity due to Israel's sins and its attitude. It makes clear that this is no accident. Yahweh has not been overpowered. Rather, Yahweh has orchestrated this judgment. The judgment and wrath are completely unpredictable here, yet the book still pleads for mercy. In chapter 3, the book takes a pivotal turn. God has been reliable and predictable in his judgment. It should not have been a surprise to anyone who had been paying attention to Yahweh's prophets because they predicted this would happen. Yet, he'd also predicted he would show mercy if they repented. He'd sworn big promises to Abraham and Aaron, David, and Moses. So if God could be relied upon to punish as he said, then God can also be relied upon to show mercy as he promises. So it proclaims, great is thy faithfulness. We're waiting for you to rescue us, Lord. Chapter 4 is a reminder of just how far God's people have fallen. It was once the land of milk and honey, but now even babies have no food to eat. Before the rich partied, but now they're fighting over scraps. The king has been dethroned and carried off into exile. Chapter 5 describes the rough situation of a variety of people hoping that God will see the sad plight of his people and restore. Since the suffering is so terrible, the author of the book is still sort of wondering. It proclaims at the end that Yahweh is king and says, restore us, unless you've already utterly rejected us. The only thing more astonishing that this punishment has come from God is that the Jews somehow still maintain their identity and faith. It's a strong testimony that something far greater is at work here. So too, the crucifixion, the plans of Rome and the Sanhedrin were to completely destroy Jesus, his legacy, and his kingdom, much like the exile. Yet, the son of God is here taking the suffering of his people. The fact that Jesus endures and his legacy continues despite all the sin and the hatred of his opponents is again a testimony to both the enduring power of God, God's forgiveness, and God's faithfulness.